Far out in the remote northwestern Pacific, islands formed by an ancient volcano rise out of the sea. They're very, very hard to reach. It's very remote. It's maybe 500 miles from the nearest population center, so it gets very few visitors. It was like Jurassic Park pretty much. I was really impressed. These are the islands of Mog, an uninhabited paradise near the northern tip of the Mariana Islands. Mog is unlike any other place I've ever been in the world. You're in the middle of absolutely nowhere and you come to what looks from a distance just like an island and then you see that it's a big volcanic crater essentially and you're able to sail inside and it all of a sudden becomes not just this big roiling Pacific but almost this lake inside the ocean. Flat, calm, very pleasant with these big kind of walls rising up around you. And that just in love itself is, is special and amazing. Mog used to be a volcano that was up above the water, but there was a large eruption at some point and the whole top of the volcano collapsed down and it left this ring of three islands around that have openings big enough to drive a ship into. And it's about a mile and a half across, so it's a pretty good size caldera inside. Within this caldera are unspoiled coral reefs. The coral diversity is impressive. There's areas where you have almost 100% coral coverage and just fields of coral and most pristine reefs that you could imagine. But what makes these waters of particular interest to scientists is what else can be found beneath the surface. You can jump in the water, dive down 30 feet, and feel that the ground there is actually hot, and you've got this hot water coming out and gas bubbles. I've heard someone say that it's like diving in champagne, and it absolutely is. It's not an exaggeration. It's pretty amazing. Volcanic gases are typically dominated by CO2. So when we heard that there were gas bubbles coming out within the coral reef area, something clicked and said, hey, this is an opportunity to go look at how volcanic CO2 might be affecting coral reef communities and use it as an analog to what's going on in the bigger ocean. The chemistry of seawater is changing throughout the world's oceans. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, human activities have increased the amount of CO2 that is released into the atmosphere. The oceans naturally absorb a percentage of atmospheric carbon dioxide every year. As the levels of CO2 increase in the atmosphere, more of it will be taken up by the oceans as well. And this causes essentially a lower pH and a more acidic condition. So this creates a situation where it's harder for corals or any other organism that forms a calcium carbonate or hard skeleton to actually lay down those skeletons and to calcify. This is known as ocean acidification, one of several effects elevated levels of CO2 is having on the world's oceans. It's predicted to severely impact coral reefs in the future. We could use this local volcanic activity to study that process in an experiment that's sort of set up by nature for us where the volcano is putting CO2 into the water and affecting the chemistry. And if conditions were right, we could possibly use that to study how ocean acidification might affect coral reefs in the future. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. 
and by Divers Direct, Emotion Sports, inspiring the pursuit of adventure and water sports. And by the following, in memory of Harriet Fagan, the Do Unto Others Trust, and the Friends of Changing Seas. Mog is part of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, a United States territory consisting of 14 islands in the Northwestern Pacific. I just absolutely love my island home. Geographically, we are approximately 1,500 miles east of the Philippines and Tokyo, and a little over 3,000 miles from the islands of Hawaii and 6,000 miles plus from the Pacific coast of the United States. So we're pretty far out here in the northwestern pocket of the Pacific. It's right near the Mariana Trench, deepest part of the ocean in the world, and it's a very volcanically active area. Mog itself hasn't erupted for a while. It's, it formed a caldera some thousands of years ago. It's not dead. There's still heat coming out and magmatic gases, but it's not one of the most active volcanoes around but potentially it could increase in activity again. In the spring of 2014, a group of 20 marine scientists from across the United States and its Pacific Island territories headed to MOG for a 10-day research expedition organized by scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. First of all, we wanted to look at um, the actual chemistry of the water there. So we took bottle samples and looked at the chemistry over a different space and we mapped that out and kind of created a map of this gradient of CO2. And the beauty of this system is that it's well contained in a relatively calm environment and in depths that scuba divers can investigate. The first order question was, do these vents change the ocean pH in this area enough to affect the corals? The answer is definitely yes. And then secondly, can you take advantage of a gradient in pH conditions, a change from normal background pH to lower and lower pH as you get closer to the vents? to look at the corals that are living in those different pH environments and see how they're growing. MOG is one of a handful of spots that offer scientists a natural laboratory to investigate what ocean acidification could look like by the end of our century. Based on these localized differences in pH levels, the team of scientists researching ocean acidification selected three distinct study sites. One is close to a vent site where waters are very acidic and the bottom is dominated by algae. The CO2 conditions there are, are analogous to what we can expect by the end of the century. About 50 meters away, the scientists selected their second study location. At this intermediate site, the CO2 levels are lower than at the vent site, but higher than in most current day ocean waters. There are some species that are more stress tolerant. And so in the intermediate site, we kind of found this community where some species were present, some were not, coral cover was not high, and it was kind of just holding on. The third site represented a coral reef with pH levels that are equivalent to what can be found near most reefs today. It's located a kilometer away from the vent site. I want to say something like 60% coral, these beautiful massive coral colonies that were many meters apart, huge hundreds of years old, all sorts of branching corals, fishes, we saw some sharks, all sorts of amazing species. So it's a very stark difference. To better understand the impact of high CO2 levels on corals, researchers collected core samples from the same species of coral at each study site. 
We took small cores from these large colonies and we immediately sealed them up underwater so that nothing you know, gets into those holes. This process does not permanently harm the corals. Once back in the lab in Miami, Florida, these cores are analyzed using a CAT scanner. What a CAT scanner does, and this is exactly the same as you would get in a doctor's office, is it takes a whole bunch of x-ray images and lines them up in a way that you create a three-dimensional structure. And so this, this view that we see here is um, both the, the top down of this core, coral core, as, the, as well as the sides, and then a 3D, 3D model here. You can see that we, you know, we can manipulate it all around with this. Um, and so if you, for instance, move right here, this, this actually will allow us to scroll through and you can see um, year after year how each of these little coral polyps grows up and down. And if you look carefully, you can see these changes in brightness, which are equivalent to changes in density. And these are the yearly rings, the yearly density rings that we actually use to measure coral calcification and, and coral growth, just like tree rings on a tree. So you can see all these yearly bands, and then we were able to graph this out and look at these changes in density from year to year, and then measure yearly calcification. When we analyzed the cores from MOG, we found that the distance in between each of these high density yearly bands was less in the high CO2 conditions. And this means that nearer to the vent, the corals were growing less every year, which is one of the things that is predicted to occur with ocean acidification. So we're really trying to figure out how ocean acidification actually slows down calcification. So it's not just that corals are putting skeleton down slower, it's, it's actually fundamentally changing the skeleton that they put down. While in the field, the scientists wanted to study how much coral fragments would grow over a three-month period in varying levels of acidity. They were collecting branching corals from one spot and putting them on disks and transplanting them to move into an area where the pH was a little bit lowered. They had two test sites, one that was significantly impacted and one that was just moderately impacted. So with field experiments, not everything works. And actually what we found was in the period from when we first went to when we returned, there was incredibly warm summer conditions and caused a mass bleaching event. Increased water temperatures are another threat global climate change poses to coral reefs. When water temperatures rise above normal, corals lose their symbiotic algae, making the corals look white or bleached. Corals depend on these algae for nourishment, and if temperatures are elevated for too long, the corals will die. And this actually affected a lot of our experiment as well. Corals are dying, and it's a bad situation, so the experiment was messed up. But while this experiment didn't pan out as planned, the researchers did get some great data from another. It was kind of a, a side experiment. Like, oh, let's put these down and see what happens. And then what we, what we saw was, was pretty amazing. So this may not look at all like the same material that a coral skeleton is made up of, but this is actually just very pure calcium carbonate, just like a coral skeleton. And we put these out at the high CO2, mid CO2 and control sites for, for about three months. On the screen here, this is actually a sample from the high CO2 site. And you can see that all of these little tiny holes and tunnels that are bored into the actual calcium carbonate. And these are called micro-boring algae. These are uh, microscopic and are actually inside the coral skeleton. In the intermediate site, you can see there's less. And in the control site, there's even, even less. So we found that there were really stark differences in the samples. You can kind of think of it like a forest where trees are essentially analogous to corals and that they're forming this kind of complex structure. And in a forest, fungi essentially break down these trees and kind of cause it to rot and decompose and break away. On coral reefs, there are similar organisms. 
as the oceans get more acidic, it's easier for these organisms to break down the coral skeletons. And this is kind of a double, um, double whammy because um, you have a situation where you have faster erosion and slower coral growth. And so you have kind of a situation where these reef frameworks are, are not able to expand and are also getting eaten away. And it's essentially a really bad situation for these, these amazing ecosystems and habitats. Another team of NOAA scientists analyzed the hot water and gases emitted by the hydrothermal vents. And this ship always comes in through here. Dr. David Butterfield has spent his career studying how deep sea volcanoes work. More than 70% uh, of the volcanic activity on the planet takes place underneath the sea surface. And that has an effect on ocean circulation, ocean chemistry. So we need to study these things just to know how the Earth works. We measured the composition of the gas bubbles that are coming out in this system. We found they were about 60% CO2, which is much higher than what you find in air, less than 1%. And the balance of the gas was a bit of mostly nitrogen and some trace gases that come out of the magma chamber. And then there's the warm water that's coming out of the ground, it comes out and sort of mixes up into the, the seawater above it. This warm water carries that low pH signal with it. The gas bubbles are rising up through the water and basically coming right out the surface, but the lower pH water is coming up through the seafloor. That's where that acidified signal is coming from. The warm waters coming up from the vents also contain trace elements that dissolved out of the volcanic rock. They're loaded with iron, and they also have other metals that potentially might be toxic. We found that there was very high arsenic in the warm fluids that are coming out of the seafloor there, and that's actually a relatively common thing for shallow hydrothermal systems. And so we have a question, does the arsenic affect the growth of the corals? And there's very little experimentation that's been done that can answer that question so far. The iron makes the water cloudy because it's forming these particles that absorb light, so the corals there get less light. You have to isolate what effect is actually affecting those corals. Is it just the pH? Is it the, the metals that are coming out? Increase in temperature, maybe? And so you have to look carefully at all those things to know, you know what effect you're actually measuring. It's very difficult to completely eliminate the possibility of other factors. Um, we specifically designed our study areas to not be in the area of very, very high, rapid activity so that they were removed and they were more natural. We looked at gas composition and a whole bunch of different things to try to eliminate those factors. MOG is part of the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument signed into law by President Bush in 2009. The monument protects roughly 95,000 square miles of land and sea, including the famous Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the oceans. These protections, as well as MOG's remoteness, mean its coral reefs are less impacted by the stressors other reefs encounter in more populated areas. The other impacts such as fishing, such as uh, nutrient runoff, things that are uh, influencing reef systems all over the world were not as big of a deal there, yet we still saw this shift, this complete ecosystem loss due to CO2. Ecosystems are so complex, we have a hard time understanding how everything kind of works its way out and how it will manifest in the end. What we have found is that the accumulation of all of these multiple stressors absolutely can cause more rapid, more catastrophic degradation than if simply one stressor is present. Another tool that helps scientists understand and quantify MOG's ecosystems are detailed maps of the study sites created by combining high-resolution images into large-scale photo mosaics. 
What this entails is establishing a 100 square meter plot and then taking about 3,000 images within that plot that are then stitched into one large landscape image, which allows us to look at the spatial patterning and the spatial arrangement of all the organisms that are in that image. To create these photo mosaics, the divers stake out a 10 meter by 10 meter area. We set a series of corner markers and floats that allow us to see the plot. And then we have a frame that holds two high resolution cameras, one set to 18 millimeters, the other set to 55 millimeters. And we swim repeated passes across this plot. The, the camera is set to interval timer, so both cameras taking a picture every second. And the idea is for the swimmer to swim every square centimeter of that plot. You do it in a reverse lawnmower pattern, so you go up and down and then side to side, trying to do about 20 passes per plot, uh, minimum 10 passes per plot, so that there's a high degree of overlap between images, um, both in the passes, and you're swimming pretty slow. It's just a little flutter kick, so that each image has about 90% overlap. While one diver is taking pictures, a second diver is taking very exact measurements. This will ensure that all the images are to scale as they're stitched together into one very high resolution image. If you zoom all the way out, it's the view that a scuba diver or a snorkeler would have when they splashed off the boat on the surface looking straight down. But as you zoom in, it would be the same resolution as you would see with your own eye, going all the way down to the polyp structure of the individual corals. And what we're able to do is create a map that has a distribution of all those organisms on there. And then we go through and classify them down to the species level if we can. And uh, what we're able to do from that is then extract all that data. So each species will come off as an individual layer and allows us to create a um, whole lot of metrics such as size distributions. We can do nearest neighbor analysis. We can do a lot of techniques that have typically been confined to the terrestrial realm because they've been able to have these large satellite derived images. Over the course of the 10-day research expedition, scientists worked hard to better understand this shallow hydrothermal vent system and gain insight into the impacts climate change will have on coral reefs in the future. This is such a unique experience to have all these different collaborators come together on board the ship. The team that we assembled for this expedition was a diverse group from many different institutions. We had chemists, geochemists, volcanologists, we had coral experts, biologists, coral ecologists, people who study algae, photographers who could make maps of the seafloor, and just a really diverse group of people to put it all together. We had local partners doing diving to actually analyze the species composition. You know, I don't know the species of algae and the species of coral in that area, and these guys are experts and were able to identify everything to a very, very fine taxonomic level. It was an amazing field team, and really pulling this all together was really, really important for actually describing it and telling the story that is Mock. A lot of the local people should communicate their knowledge about the archipelago. This is my first trip up here. So as a tomorrow, it's like a, I've fulfilled the dream kind of thing. I, I made it up the whole chain. I've been able to see all the islands. So it's uh, something important for me. I think we're, we're in a period where we really have to do something now about global increase in CO2. It may be too late to prevent major effects, but even so, we need to figure out a way to slow it down or possibly remove CO2 from the atmosphere somehow. We're giving up a lot of our resources just for the money when it's not all about that. What about, what about your kids? What about your kids' kids, you know? I want my son to experience what I experience. I want his son to experience that too. It's about what you leave behind for your, your next generation. So 
So they always teach us to respect our elders and make your ancestors proud. Our ancestors, they had such a connection with the environment. Something got lost along the way. And thank goodness that we have a number of individuals that have such foresight. I think it, that's just the ancestors speaking through us, that this is important now. Now is the time to act, to protect what you have left. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, Emotion Sports, inspiring the pursuit of adventure and water sports. And by the following, in memory of Harriet Fagan, the Do Unto Others Trust, and the Friends of Changing Seas. Thank you.